Thank you all for joining us today for our IC Talk. I am L. Tusi, the co-chair of the International Community for the Society of Professional Journalists. We appreciate those of you that are tuning in um, to join us for our session. Before we get started with our guests today, I wanna to make sure we go over some housekeeping items. Today's talk is a conversation with the guests and myself. Um, I will be taking questions during, during our talk. So when you have a question, please make sure to add that to the Q&A portion and we'll make sure to unmute you and you can ask the question directly. If you want me to ask the question for you, please make a note of that and I'll be happy to do so. So please leave the chat section for any technical questions, links, and anything that you want to add to the conversation in real time. My co-chair, Dan Kubiski will keep an eye on that for us. So I guess let's get to it. Uh, we have a pleasure of having Audrey Lau, the managing editor of Digital News at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, where she oversees editorial, social, interactive teams. She's a former editor in chief of Huffington Post Canada, where she led the strategic and editorial direction of the site, as well as the French ed edition of Huffington Post Quebec. Audrey previously worked for CBC News as a TV reporter, video journalist, writer, producer, and online editor um, in nine newsrooms across Canada. That's impressive, that's incredible. It was brought to our attention that CBC decided last year on November 1st to turn off their commenting section on Facebook with the hope to make online spaces safer by minimizing harassment and abuse of their story subjects and commenters. I'm really looking forward to digging deeper with Audrey today and with the, about this move by CBC. So thank you, Audrey, for joining us. Thanks for the invitation. Of course. So before I, uh, we head right into it and we kind of dig deep into it, I always really like to kind of start from the beginning and just going over your, you know, your trajectory and your journalism career. You first started reporting in television and then you headed straight into the editorial, social, interactive teams and leading those teams. Um, how and why did you decide to head in that direction? Uh -huh. um, so I moved from broadcast into digital because there were just so many unknowns in digital to play around with in terms of storytelling and connecting with the audience. And um, then as I moved into HuffPost um, and was able to increasingly move into supervisory roles, then opened up the world of how um, you know, leading and managing and operations and revenue and finance intersected with um, how journalism was developing. So I think that's, and none of it was planned. I'd love to say that I had a five-year plan and this is where I wanted to be, but it was all kind of just running around and, and trying different things. And, and, and here we are. <laughs> I love that. Cause you, sometimes you never know where your career takes you. And it's, it's pretty it's incredible when I read your, your history of where you started and where you got to, it's, it was cool to see that because that's such a different path that a lot of people take, but so many things are digital now. Yeah, and I've been fortunate to even have those opportunities to play around um, and to have had great bosses and um, great projects to try different things. Um, yeah, it's been exciting and fun. And, and how long have you been in the digital space in your career? Oh, you're really making me count backwards. Um, do, 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 do. So here's a funny story. When I graduated from university, one of my first jobs was running the CBC News website overnight from midnight to 8 a.m. And that was like 1999. Uh, and I did that for a couple of months. We were hand coding things still and um, using real real media player I can't even remember it was and then I moved into tv so you count a couple of months there I moved into tv for about uh, 10 years and then digital so I guess digitally I've probably been in that space for about eight, 12 years right my math is terrible <laughs> <laughs> so when did you first started noticing the toxicity of um the comment sections in social media is it something that was it a certain event or something that happened that brought this to your attention or is it just the accumulation of things that have been happening over this period of time that you've noticed it in your career? Um, I mean, I'd say in my career, it's probably not soon after you're just on those platforms, right? And you start going into different 
community groups, you know, even before social chat groups and things like that. It's just, you know, the age old, the anonymity and the power and the ability to provoke without any um, consequences, really. Um, so, I mean, it's always been there. I think if we're talking about how this project came to be, certainly an accumulation of how sustainable is this, both for uh, an organization, but also for uh, community and individuals. Um, so certainly a, an accumulation would be what led us to, to start talking about this kind of project. So was there a particular instance with CBC that made this happen? It was just... No, I think that it probably started with, um, we started um, a committee, so a um, English services on the CBC side, a committee, to look at uh, reviewing our social strategy. You know, what is the CBC doing on social? What do we stand for? What are our goals and strategies? And quickly our attention turned to the Facebook comments um, because complaints were rising, um, concern for the well-being of our staff uh, and also our audience was rising. And, you know, to be realistic, costs were rising. Um, you know, we use, like many organizations, a third party company to do the bulk of our moderation. Um, there's a cost to that. And there's also a cost in terms of um, time and effort and uh, the value of what our staff is doing on there. So it all kind of accumulated with this review. And we thought, you know what, we can't ignore this anymore, that sustainability uh, discussion. So that's what led us to this path of we have to do something. Right. And so what were some of the concerns or obstacles by, in order to make this a reality? I'm sure there's like lots of conversations that had to be had. Um, can you give us an idea what that, what that looks like if you're tr thinking about it? For sure. And I forgot to mention one thing that was uh, critical to us going on this path was um, in March of last year, Facebook quietly unveiled the functionality to limit comments. And so that's uh, a big reason why we started playing around with, well, what could we do? You know, what's available in our circle of tools that we can use? So I, that's an important thing to mention as to why I think that conversation was, was able to accelerate. Um, so to your question as to what barriers, I mean, time and effort, right? You're talking and, and courage, I would say, to have the backing of all of our leaders and then onward um, to make this fundamental change. Um, so, you know, it wasn't barriers like, I, I don't recall anyone saying, hold on, we shouldn't do this. I think philosophically everyone agreed that that was a good thing to experiment with. What would happen if we closed comments? Um, it's, worth, it's, it's, it's worth looking at. I think the barriers were just checking off to make sure that every stakeholder, for lack of a better word, because there are many, um, was informed, was bought in, was um, updated throughout. And, you know, when I'm talking about stakeholders, I'm talking about everyone from, um, you know, the junior associate producer who runs social to editorial leaders, um, to research and finance and um, HR, you know, like everyone needed to know what we were doing and why, so that the path would be clear. Um, and then the second thing would be just properly setting up. We set this up as an experiment. We weren't going to jump right into it. We wanted to be intentional and look at what are we, uh, what hypothesis are we testing? What metrics are we tracking? What else do we need to um, mark down as we continue? And then take those results uh, and, and do something with them in a meaningful way. So that was a lot of setting up to get to that point. Right. I mean, now that you mentioned, it seems like there's so many people that are involved with the social presence of a news organization. So just trying to get the wheels turning for something like this, I can imagine it's like overwhelming, you know? Well, you have to also take into account, you know, how does each um, news newsroom, so national to local, um, a radio show, uh, a TV newscast, um, a reporter, how did they rely or not rely on Facebook? How would this move impact their work? Um, we certainly didn't want to impede anything they were doing um, with community engagement, um, initiatives, town halls. I mean, that's all the good stuff of social, right? Um, 
is story ideas, um, people asking us legitimate questions that we can help them answer. So we needed to weigh keeping those avenues open while aiming to close comments on the harmful and, and toxic um, movement and comments. Okay. That kind of segues into my next question. Um, what was that reaction from reporters or people, members of the team when you announced, hey, we're thinking about closing down the comment section? Was it uh, negative, negative or? Overwhelmingly positive. positive. Um, you know, we're, I'm glad we're doing something. It's worth it. It's about time. Um, I think that any hesitation was that uh, um, risk of losing community connection. I think that was the biggest hesitation. You know, we all recognize that Facebook is an important um, way to connect to communities that we can't reach or um, people who we were not reaching in other avenues. So we wanted to be authentic to that and still uh, while we set up this experiment. Right. And I wanna to touch on the, you mentioned the functionality to limit comments back in March with Facebook. Can you talk to me about that and how that affected what that actually means for newsrooms? Because there are some people that may be freelancers that may not understand what that actually means for bigger organizations and those limitations with the, with the comments. Um, so you can actually control who can comment on your page um, or on your, or per post. Um, it can be followers only. And it'll have to pardon me if I'm not fully accurate because they do change the functionalities every once in a while. Um, but as far as I understand it, you can limit uh, it to people who follow you, to nobody at all, um, uh, to like, there's ways you can control how much you limit. Um, and so our experiment went ahead with um, on every story link or video post, we would close comments completely. And um, we had a little message at the top that said, explained what we were doing and for how long. Um, there was a handful of exceptions. So speaking to that community authenticity and connection, um, we know that indigenous communities in Canada use Facebook in a very positive way uh, mm -hmm. to connect with each other as a main means, especially where bandwidth and Wi-Fi is low. Um, so, and, and the conversation on those pages tended to be um, positive. So that was an exception. Um, call outs or community related event uh, type posts, we kept those comments open okay. um, and Facebook groups. Okay. We don't have many. Right. And I think it's easy to assume, like when I first heard about this, I'm like, wow, this is definitely a great step to protect journalists from the attacks that we see on social media. But I assume, I mean, reading into this a little bit further and looking into it, it's also, I think, and maybe you can talk more about this, is protecting those that are within the comment section, the communities, those people that are involved within the story. Can you talk more about the, the, the length of, it, 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 this wasn't just a measure to protect journalists, right? It was more so everyone that's involved in this ecosystem of comments on social, especially Facebook, right? Yeah, so this is the interesting, um, some of the interesting results that we found. So of course, explicitly journalists who are attacked, this would be one way to shield them a little bit from that. Um, but when we think about journalists being attacked, we think about very explicit threats to them. Um, but there's other harm that we didn't realize um, was impacting uh, the well-being of our staff. So, you know, we we did a review later on of comments, and we had a lot of comments saying, uh, especially for people who worked in social day in and day out, they said they didn't realize the drip, drip, drip of the way they worked and how they absorbed all of the comments and DMs that came at them until it stopped. And then they realized the impact of how that was released off of them. Um, so there's that kind of harm to our staff. And then there's harm to our audience uh, in that they get attacked in the comments. Like our commenters attack each other. Um, right. So there was that uh, development we didn't fully realize. And then lastly, um, our, the subjects of our stories that we were sharing, um, they would get attacked. 
when we shared their stories and shared our journalism. So um, there was harm there as well. You know, one early example when we started talking about this experiment, this young man um, uh, got COVID and just wanted and was just sharing his experience in the hospital. And somehow he got attacked in the comments. And not only that, um, people went after him on his personal accounts and that of his family. And I just, it kind of, that brought home how much people go to that effort to go after someone who was simply sharing their story. Um, so those were all, um, so what changed uh, with comments being closed is we suddenly saw more range of stories um, that our staff felt, I guess, better in sharing. And we didn't realize how much um, pulling back they had done. So stories we knew would attract um, toxicity, so stories that centered on women, LGBTQ community, um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, um, they were not sharing those on Facebook on purpose because they knew that that would draw attention in the comments. Um, and so when we did close comments, we discovered a larger diversity of stories and content were suddenly being shared on our pages. You know, it's really interesting you say that because I recently worked on a story for New York Times that involved minors and young young girls. And there were conversations that were being had of what kind of information do we want to include in, in the article to protect them in their future online presence? Because doxing is a real thing, uh, protecting the subject because they won't realize, you know, five years, 10 years down the line, any time someone searches their name, that can pop up and how... Can, I didn't realize that that was something that newsrooms were thinking about, right? Um, and journalists, I mean, I, I'm a, I freelanced for that piece. I didn't realize that these were the conversations being had in newsrooms and, you know, to take that next step to think about that presence for the subject matter. So it's interesting to see that the, the measures that are taken. And what was interesting, because um, we were tracking comments um, comments in the, in like feedback in emails or uh, feedback and in interactions with our staff. We had more than one situation where um, people agreed to do interviews with CBC because we had closed comments. Um, wow. Because they knew they weren't subjecting themselves to more exposure of being attacked on social. Um, because they knew those interviews would be shared on our Facebook pages. And so I, I, we didn't an anticipate that as a result um, of closing comments. That's incredible. And, and so, I mean, this was, you started this in November. Is it too soon to ask about what are some of the metrics that you guys are seeing so far? I mean, so far, it seems like there's a positive reaction. Um, are there benchmark um, goals are setting? So we, our experiment was June until October 31st. And that's the period where we looked and made a decision based on those results. So we were tracking, um, you know, your referrals, engagement, reach on Facebook. Um, we tracked um, audience reaction. Um, and so basically, I mean, the biggest thing was there was negligible change in some of those Facebook metrics. And then um, in terms of the results, like I mentioned to the journalism, I mean, you couldn't argue with the positive side of the gains we made in the journalism side of things. So that's when we made the decision, decision to make it permanent um, was in November. And right. I guess we've just sort of, it's just, it's quickly become just standard business. Like that's just been a standard, like comments are off. Um, we do open them for call-outs to ask for uh, story follow-ups or, um, you know, help or call out for weather photos. You know, that stuff still remains, um, but we do keep them closed on story links. And the thing is, you know, we have heard criticism, you're shutting down free speech, but there are lots of other avenues that people can reach us, can comment, can have discussion. You know, our co comments on our own website are still open. So right. it's not like there's nowhere to talk about our stories or, or with us. And how prevalent is CBC on other social media platforms? Is this something that you would consider on other platforms as well? Um, is that even an um, option, do you think? So we're on Instagram and Twitter uh, and Snapchat. 
I think right now we are not considering it actively, but obviously watching uh, like Instagram right now is still a fairly positive place. Um, and Twitter, we don't moderate. Um, I think Twitter is just there, right. <laughs> to be honest. Like it's not really a place for meaningful discourse. Um, and there are tools as well um, to limit comments there. But I think in terms of like where we're putting our energies, we're satisfied with where we are right now. But we've got enough evidence, enough experience now that if it if it needed to, that we could embark on a similar experiment on those other platforms. So if you could, you know, what would be some tips you would give other news leaders or members of leadership at news networks as to how to approach doing something like this? Um, be as, I'm sure that yeah. that, you, know, you mentioned earlier how it happened, but I'm sure there's a, like, you can think about tips and frameworks that you can think about um, in order to do something like I this. I think um, be a, be as transparent as possible, uh, both with your audience and with your staff. I think that was the key thing. We spent a lot of our time uh, on communications. Um, you know, we set up an FAQ for our staff and we went through and we, and we revised it and updated it as we went so that they knew every step of the way, what our motivation was, um, how things were working down to, you know, how do I, turn off comments on Facebook, like to instructions, right? Because we were turning them off on lives and you could only do that after the live was over. Um, but also including transparently like what we're tracking and what we're going to do with it after. And um, I think that went a long way to having the support and the understanding of what we're doing. And then transparently with the public, right? Because every, you know, yes, we're going to get criticized for it no matter what. So let's just be transparent with, with that. So we used our editor-in-chief's um, call, blog to um, explain it and introduce it. And then again, when we made the decision to make it permanent, um, we did some external media um, interviews to explain that. Um, I think that goes a long way. And then setting up the framework, um, set it up like an experiment and um be thorough because like you said Facebook is in every facet of a media organization so don't overlook you know it's not just news right yeah. it's communications it's revenue it's media solutions and sales right so your part it's a corporate decision then you know include everybody in it Sure. And I'm curious, did any other um, news organizations reach out to see what has been your experience so far? And yep. what were those questions or what was those conversations like? Because I'm curious to see if others are thinking. Yeah, lots. Um, Brody Fenlon, our editor in chief, got a lot of um, queries from international as well as Canadian media. Mm -hmm. um, I think most of the questions were what were the results? <laughs> um, Makes how, sense. <laughs> yeah. How did your staff take it? Um, how much, um, what kind of feedback did you get from the public? Um, we track sentiment in terms of um, what was sent to our audience relations departments. And I would say that it was 50 50 for and against. Okay. Um, yeah. Wow. Wow. And so, what would you like to see happen in the future of news consumption via social? Um, concerned, this is like, you, you, I consider you the expert here when it comes to the, this element of what would you like to be seeing done and how we're, how the audience is interacting with like CBC or your journalists or your teams via social? What do you see, how do you see that happening in the future now that you've done this one step with shutting off comments and there was a positive, I mean, you've had both feedbacks, right? But overall, very positive. Um, where do you see this going in the next couple of years? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. Where would, you, I, you know where would you hope for it to go? You know, I mean, maybe put that out into the universe. <laughs> you know, I do love that, that other organizations were watching what we were doing. I would like to see them try similar things to see if that helps um, bolster their journalism 
because uh, it certainly, I would argue, um, has in a lot of ways helped us. Um, you know, I mentioned that sources and interview subjects were more willing to talk to us, that we were able to share a broader range of stories. Like, I think that if more organizations take a serious look at trying this out, you know, my question would be, will that improve the journalism we do across the board in the industry? Um, and I think there's also a great discussion to be had about the effort that we put into something like Facebook comments. Um, there's a bit of a obligatory feeling, I think. Obviously when Facebook started and comments started, of course you had to be on there, but Facebook has evolved. Our understanding of social media and algorithms has evolved. So why, you know, I, I think that our approach and our staffing and our resourcing should evolve too. And I think maybe that's lagging a little bit. You know, there is that feeling that you must do this. Well, I, you know, I would challenge organizations to say, do we really have to? Right. You know, I'd like to go back to when we were discussing um, the psychological impact of social media on journalists. And I found that very fascinating that journalists were holding themselves back maybe a little bit with um, the stories they were pursuing. Um, I, can you, can we talk about that a little bit more? Because that sure. really kind of blows my mind because so, to think like a little, is, a little thing like comments on social media could have that effect, right? Yeah. So not um, just to clarify, it wasn't the stories we were pursuing. It was the finished product that we were sharing or not sharing on our mm -hmm. Facebook pages. And so, yeah, it seems like a small thing, but what ends up happening is if you looked at our pages, so it, it created that perception that the only stories worth sharing are mm -hmm. safe, uh, male-centered, mm -hmm. um, non-controversial or non, or stories that don't teach you and enlighten anything or give you a window into a different community. So like, that was astonishing to me when we realized that. Um, it certainly wasn't a policy. It was just something that was quietly like, uh, it just quietly happened. Right. Because we were worried about what we knew um, we were putting story subjects into. Is that something that we should, that news organizations should be concerned about um, going forward when it comes to how we're presenting our stories and whatnot on, onto platforms? For sure, because I mean, we know already that algorithms tend to recirculate within the same bubble. So if we're perpetuating that with our content, um, that's a big consideration, right? Especially right. when we're trying so hard to move the needle on inclusive coverage um, and a diverse range of issues and voices. Well, that right. certainly holds that all back. And what kind of stories are you guys now seeing that there's more of or that's thriving after this whole situation, especially in November, making the final decision, this is going to be more permanent. Are you, I know you mentioned stories about women, LGBTQ. Are there other stories that kind of thrived in this space for you guys? That kind I of mean, I would argue, I mean, I would argue every story because you know, we are making a concerted effort, like 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 most media, to to be more um, representative of our country, and so that means that any story would include women, members of the LGBTQ community, the Black community, speaking on any topic, right? So, um, you know, I I hope that means that we're doing a better job on that reflection and representation. Amazing. Is there anything you'd like to add about your findings from um, this experiment that maybe we haven't covered? Um, I'm just looking at my notes. There were a couple <laughs> of like feedback from the public that I was like, oh, I didn't really think about it. And one was that somebody said, I'm glad that the comments were closed because then it stops the spread of misinformation and disinformation. And I thought, huh, okay. But then that person went further and they said, you know, my parents were constantly telling me these things and I would say to them, no, that's, that's inaccurate. And they say, oh, well, I saw it on the CBC. But then when that person went to track it, it was, they saw it in the comments of yeah. our page. 
And so there was so much to that that I didn't realize, you know, um, of how there's a bit of social media literacy there. But there's also brand association, right? Um, we can't control that necessarily. Like we try to moderate um, those types of comments, but they get through. And so how people were perceiving what was associated to that, um, that was an interesting development too. That's fascinating. So it's people were considering comments as a part of your facts that are being right. recorded because that the format of the social media was just, well, I saw it there, right? Yeah. That's yeah. wild. So we do have a question. Um, were there actual threats against journalists or even other commenters under the old system? Yeah. Yeah. And, and to what degree were those threats, I mean, were they balanced? Is it more towards the journalists, more towards the commenters that you were seeing those? There's no real measurement, right? It's just what's when, happening. No, no, not really. Yeah. And after um, this past year of reflecting on what this took toll on psychologically, whether it's for journal the, your team members and whatnot, is there going to be, do you think it's important for newsrooms to start considering um, some sort of, uh, I don't know, something to get a resource for your team members to, to handle um, looking through and going through these situations. Like, like I remember you mentioned the social media team, they didn't realize until they actually stopped how much it was affecting them. I mean, I remember hearing stories about third party members for Facebook, like they're going through content, trying yep. to mediate things, right? Yep. So are, do you guys have resources like that available for your team members or how, and if not, is this something that like overall news um, organizations should be thinking about having for their social media teams and or journalists? Yeah, that's something that's an ongoing discussion for sure for us. Um, I mean, we have guidance for, you know, how to handle escalating situations. Um, we very much support um, the people who work on our social media stepping back and taking a break. Um, it, it, and then you have that discussion of the balance of how much you put in front of them when social media is your job, right? How much is reasonable um, for them to be doing? Um, you know, we do use a third party company to moderate comments as well, um, but there's lots of places where our staff are, are involved. Um, so yes, uh, to answer your question, that is something that should be top of mind. We, we haven't solved that um, in terms of like, what is the best way? Because there's lots of different ways to support our staff who touch social media. Right. And I know we did get a question. Um, I have another question. Do you see any difference in the reaction to the new policy between the English and the French language services of CBC? So the policy of closing comments on Facebook is for the English side only. Um, okay. The French side has not um, taken that on. Is there a reason why that decision was made or is that? It's a, it's a different uh, division. So right. okay. uh, I'm not super sure. <laughs> okay. Um, we did have a question that came in via email. And... Sorry, but they are, but they are looking but they are looking um, like, it's not like we don't talk to each other. I shouldn't right, right. leave that impression. Yeah, we have shared our, um, our results and, and, and the work we did. So, you know, we talk to each other. Sure, sure. So I know we had a question that came in um, earlier to the broadcast. And so we tend to have a wide range of members that view the IC Talks. And we had someone that was a fresh graduate, journalism graduate, and they wanted to know, as a woman that is in the position that makes decisions, you've carved out a place for yourself and for all women in the future to take a place at the table. And that's very admirable and inspiring. What tips would you give for up and coming journalists to get to the positions like you have, especially as a woman in the space? That's a good question. Everyone has imposter syndrome. You're not alone. And um, find ways to silence that, that negative voice um, whenever it comes up. 
Um, I think that's something that comes up a lot in a lot of the women that I talk to. And be fearless and um, create your own support group. I love that. And is there anything else that you wanted to add about the CBC story, about the, the actions that you guys have taken, if there's any other information that maybe we haven't covered that you want to mention? Uh, I think, no, I think we covered most of it. Yeah. I love that. So, so something that we do with all of our guests, uh, we always ask them, what does press freedom, freedom mean to, me, to them? So my question to you as the final question is, what does press freedom mean to you? Um, so I always think about my parents. Um, they grew up in Hong Kong and they immigrated to Canada in the 60s. And they um, started a community radio program uh, in Chinese for the um, Chinese community in Vancouver, which is where I grew up. And a lot of their um, radio programming was aimed at helping newcomers um, integrate into Canadian society, like teaching them how to vote, um, introducing them to political candidates, getting to the polling station. And I think a lot about that um, when I think about that question, because it means to me that they just did it because it was uh, an impactful thing to do. You know, it wasn't, and, and it was done without any fear. I think that if they had stayed in Hong Kong of um, government influence or, um, you know, cultural limitations, and so I think about that a lot. And of course I grew up in that environment. And so I think it means that, you know, to just pursue sharing information um, and pursue telling stories without worrying about anything else because it's the right thing to do. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, and thank you for those that have joined us today. And before we, we sign off, I wanted to share with you all uh, that we have an announcement for our next talk that's going to be taking place on Tuesday, January 25th, with the acting Voice of America director, Yolanda Lopez, and the editor for New Standards and Best Practices, Steve Springer. And they're going to be discussing the battles they have waged in the past to protect the editorial independence of the VOA. So we will be having the honor of the SPJ president-elect hosting that talk for us, Claire Reagan, and we hope that you can tune in with us. Um, we will provide a link um, in our weekly newsletter. I don't know if Dan's gonna be including that also into the chat feature, um, but you can definitely see that in our weekly newsletter if you wanna join us on the 25th. Again, thank you so much, Audrey, for joining us today and sharing with us um, the journey of CBC this last year with the, the Facebook comment section and how that's been going for you. I hope we can follow up with you, hopefully maybe in the next you know end of the year and see how it's been going. And maybe if the French section of CBC decides to, to take that on, I'd love to, we'd love to get that feedback to see how that's going as well. For sure. Thank you. So much. Thank you.